Rock Talk. Back. Thank you very much for Congressman Tom DeLay, who uh, spent some time with us, and of course to J.R. Holen Van Mosher, who just stepped out. Uh, we're going to move right on to our next guest, who uh, is an attorney, former corporate lawyer, uh, the author of uh, Credential to Destroy, How and Why Education Becomes a Weapon. She also has a website called InvisibleSurfsCaller.com, and uh, we're going to, she's this week's and probably every week's uh, Common Core expert, and we'd like to welcome to the program Robin Eubanks. Robin, thanks for spending some time with us. Have, be here. Thank you. And uh, good morning, Robin. We'll this just is, introduce this, everybody this, first. This, That's Mike. This is Mike. This is and, Skip. And Hi, Skip. Mike. Good morning. And I'm Steve. Hi. Hi. How you doing? And I've been, I, 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 I've been a fan of your blog for some time. It, it's full of information. I, I confess that I don't always have enough time to read all of it, but it, every, every time I dip in, it's it's full of uh, of, of, of very uh, powerful stuff. And uh, you're an analytical type uh, lawyer, I believe. That uh, you know, rather than the average courtroom type, you your job is is more to analyze deals and and facts. And uh, and a mom, and you became alarmed. And why don't you take it from there? Well, I um, basically would be sitting in a meeting and hear an explanation that didn't quite ring true, and. You find that a lot in in education, where it's a plausible explanation, but it happens to be false. And I guess my background of doing a lot of due diligence on deals and dealing with underwriters and corporate, and, and my job was always to ferret out exactly what was going on, what 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 the real deal was, what what the liabilities were. And so I guess I'm sort of attuned to, to thinking in certain terms. So if I hear a false explanation, then... My question becomes, does the person who's telling me the false story understand it's false? And if so, so what are they trying to really do? Or if, if they don't understand it's false, who gave them the false story to spread? And so I guess thinking that way uh, initially um, caused me to understand a lot about uh, the math wars because Georgia had gone to what was called integrated math. And when I started looking into it, I discovered there were all these multi-million dollar grants from the National Science Foundation that basically were going into the pocket of all of the various people who seemed to be advocating um, for the integrated math. And then I heard that the integrated math was, in fact, piloting um, the Common Core direction. And I also discovered that they weren't interested in teaching content. They were interested in teaching a certain way, what were called learning frameworks. And the learning frameworks were what guided what had to go on in the classroom. It's what guided the assessments. They were, they were designed around not, ex, not uh, explaining the work in advance so you see how students strategize if they either haven't been taught the material first or uh, how they strategize if there is no fixed answer. And I was trying to figure out why anyone would do that. So uh, it's little steps of just sort of things not fitting and then looking further and then realizing that everything having to do with race to the top was designed about around those learning frameworks and not the actual standards themselves. So I, I, that gave me some insights into where the Common Core implementation was actually going to go, and, and that's, that's sort of what, what set me off in the direction that eventually produced both the book and the blog, which are pretty separate. The blog tends to be me reacting to in, uh, that week's planned implementation or announcements from Education Week or other sources. So it's kind of the uh, real-time alarm spreading of this is what's planned and this is why it's so alarming versus the um, the book's purpose is to say, this has been the desire for decades. It changes its name, but the intentions never change. So that, uh, you know, whenever education reform comes on somebody's radar, maybe they get a, a principal that retires. 
that or a new superintendent, all of a sudden they realize something's dramatically ch- changed. That they can, uh, you know, turn to the book and realize what was really going on with the reading wars, what's really going on with the math wars, what competency really means, and it ties previously to outcomes-based education, and before that, Ralph Tyler's work involving objectives. And so it put everything into context so that Common Core isn't, isn't just stranded out there. And it's my belief that Common Core is basically a ruse to change the nature of what goes on in the classroom and especially to push um, computers in the classroom because the computer has the ability to uh, gain a lot of information about what kind of strategies a student uses, what their values are, um, what it takes to change their values. All of that's being tracked at, by that computer, and it then becomes... It's still anonymous data, maybe, but it becomes highly useful data about what, how what goes on in the classroom can change how um, students perceive the world around them. And so um, putting all that together, I'm trying to both, you know, spread the word on what's really going on in time and um, also to, to put it into context. Right. So, you know, a lot of the wars that go on on Common Core at the more local level, and we've got some really good activists in here in, in New Hampshire, and on a future occasion, if we should be so lucky, we're going to bring in Anne-Marie Banfield, who is absolutely on fire fighting this stuff here in, in New Hampshire. But it seems to me at the, at the local level, the, uh, the wars are over content, over indoctrination, which is inherent in some of that content, and over the lack of teaching of some of our founding principles and, and history. Uh, what, uh, what you have also picked up on is what you call the attempt to destroy the axe maker's mind, the inability, or the, rather to destroy the ability of people to think outside the box, to think for themselves, and to deduce. And, you know, as I read that stuff, it reminds me of my childhood education, and I always learned the structure. I learned in layers uh, the, the foundation and then the principles that knit each, each piece together until you know you got to the, the top of this particular uh, branch of knowledge and you could deduce where you were going because you had the principles. They don't teach it that way. They teach pieces that all stand alone and don't and don't relate. And then you know we we wonder why the kids can't put it together. They're taught not to put it together. So uh, again, back or to or even you. worse than that, what I'm really seeing is is less st- teaching freestanding stuff. And what you're describing is that you've, you learn the bits and pieces and read and put things together, and you developed your own conceptual understanding, and you understood how things fit together. Common Core wants to provide the conceptual understandings. They, they want you to frame things in terms of oppression, race, poverty, social justice. They call them enduring understandings, and that's the, they, they use various terms. They use lens, they use metaphor, they use, but they want that to, see, to be how you perceive the world, and that's a huge part of, of the Common Core implementation, and that, that desire actually goes back a number of decades to um, Abraham Maslow's work, from um, the early 60s, what was called humanist psychology. Um, In 1962, there was a book that um, he and Carl Rogers prepared for the National Education Association called um, Perceiving, uh, Being, Becoming, and it was called A New Focus for Education. And a lot of what is called 21st century skills, a lot of the concepts that they want to push via the Common Core come out of, of that humanist psychology work. It's also that desire to shut down that axe maker's mind because if you, if you don't have an axe maker's mind, you're not, you're not going to have, pick up the flaws in the concepts that are provided. You won't pick up on the fact that that plausible explanation happens to be false. Um, it's highly useful for, I mean, the, the documents all push this idea that we need to be shifting to more of a planned economy, a planned society. Um, I was, before I you know, came on the radio program, I was reading a, a McKinsey report um, that came out in October that I'm getting ready to write about that, that brags about the fact that um, 
and educational, these person, the personalized learning that we're going to be able to get through the adaptive software will be able to ascertain what an individual stu student's motivations are. It'll be able to change their mindsets, and it'll be able to track their learning strategies. Um, and that's, 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 um, that's not what you do in a free society. Uh, and that is unbelievably useful for anyone trying to figure out, for example, how to market a product, how to market a political campaign. I mean, think of the value of knowing that information if you were a political candidate. Is there a way, and I, I haven't read your book yet, but I, I want to. Mike's got it five feet away from me, and I'm like, oh, give me that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have so much information, and you've clearly gone all the way back into, through decades to really dig out the roots of this. But we live in a bumper sticker culture, and really kind of sometimes to break the ice to get through that, to really begin to expose people. And we do it at the local level, but we, we deal with activists. And these are people who are in tune with things that are going on. They're paying attention. Most people aren't like that. Do you have any thoughts about how we start to get through to people about this? It's a, it's a world where the only information that you're going to have is the information somebody is giving you, uh, is, is allowing you to know. If you go back to the idea of how they want to teach reading, the re one of the reasons that uh, they want to push whole language is that you systematically dole out the vocabulary that people are going to have that becomes the, the language that they used to think with. That's how... Um, how calculating the, uh, the the common core is, but, and and you can look at the progression through elementary school, and if you teach somebody to read phonetically, the kind of kind of information that would be accessible to a, a second grader who was taught to read properly is is less than what they now uh, contemplate moving through over the course of the six years of elementary school. It, it, it is very much about circumscribing the information. And even um, the online learning programs that you're seeing so much of, if you think about what they're saying that they're doing, they're only they're, they're going to say, this is what you need to know. And if you know that, you can move on. It's, uh, it's none of this, you, you read the information, you listen to the lecture, you pierce it together. It's, it, it's very, very limited in what anyone can know. And there, it, there's um, language about democratizing expertise, uh, complaining about uh, the fact that people who are good at what they do lord it over people who aren't as good at what they do. But we need the people who are good at what they do. There, there's always an assumption running through all of this literature going back decades that um, the, the economy is a fixed sum, it's, it's, it, that you can basically move things around and not have any harm. And that's not true. And unless we begin to better understand what is be, the, they're, they're trying to get political and economic power through education reforms. But we're, in a lot of instances, I think we're already suffering as an economy and as a society from the shutdown and knowledge and information and whole language programs from the 90s. And th this, the co actual Common Core implementation is like um, shutting it all down and trying to make the point that nobody really needs knowledge, and that's not true. And the only way we're going to discover just how wrong the theories are that are being implemented is when the the economies start going into tailspin because you're you're you've got expectations being created by the fact that you're providing these credentials, both a high school diploma, college credentials, but because there's no knowledge underlying it, the the person and they may have gotten their credentials say through group projects so that as an individual they don't know much and an employer is not going to not it's going to think of them as not be, being worth more than basically minimum wage time and but they have that credential and they they have expectations and when you get into the literature they talk about the political power you could get from shattered expectations and those are people's lives, and all of the people who are who are framing all these education reforms and the associated political forms reforms can think of as the the, the political power that's going to accrue to anyone in a position of authority in the public sector 
from the reforms, but no. you're talking about shattering people's lives. I, I, I didn't use the language about credential to, to destroy lightly. It's, it's the destruction is it's individual lives. It's, it's an economy. It's what makes made this nation great. You know, we're not teaching about the founding father principles because they don't want it, the protections that were written into the U.S. Constitution to prevent a public sector centric economy and society. Um, they want to push towards. There's this idea that because of our level of technology in the West, and especially in the U.S., that we're at a stage that um, Karl Marx wrote about and said, you know, at that stage you can have redistribution and you're not just going to be ensuring poverty. Well, he was wrong, but a lot of people believe that or want to believe that. And underlying the education reforms, when you get to a certain level, what I'm discovering is everybody starts talking about Karl Marx. And I'm, that was in my 50s till I thought about him. I didn't go looking to him. But really, you get about four layers down into education reform, and everybody's saying the same thing and has been for decades. So you have to talk about it to some extent. I try to joke about it a little bit. If you, if you read the blog, you'll notice I usually call him Uncle Carl. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, and, 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 and uh, if, if we mention it, they say we're, we're seeing communists everywhere. We're seeing ghosts. But I know Skip has some questions than I do. Yeah. Um, Robin, this is Skip Murphy, and I appreciate Hi. you coming on the show. Um, you know, all I have to say is Bill Ayers, and you go back to the 60s, and I'm, you know, in my middle 50s now, and I grew up when education really was education, that we we did the repetition, we, we memorized the tables, and we built that knowledge base on which critical thinking is absolutely dependent upon. Uh, and we hear nowadays that, well, we have to teach critical thinking, we have to cre- teach critical thinking, and I never hear... Well, what about the knowledge base underneath that? And you've been talking about what kind of a knowledge base that they're trying to build. It's a slanted worldview, and it's very minimalist so that people can't think for themselves because of the group environments they're trying to push. My question is, for, and we're, we're starting to see a wake-up here in New Hampshire, that more and more parents are trying to say, we want good educations. But you brought up an important thing. More and more, everything is now computer-based. Everything's going to be run on tablets in the classrooms. We've posted some of the stuff, some of the worksheets that have come home from Common Core certified type environments, and there's little outrage. So how are parents going to go in and say, what are you teaching my kids, and how do we get access to this? Because some of these folks, they don't want to give up that access. They say, well, that's not for you to have. Well, and that's the, the whole push towards digital textbooks is designed to ensure that the parents won't have access to what's really going on in, in the classroom so that they can be outraged. And um, there's a consistent belief among education radicals, and they call themselves radicals, and they, they mean it in the old-fashioned. They want to get at the root and change things dramatically, um, and they're proud of being radicals. They have always believed that as long as a, a child has at least a B average, parents don't get outraged. And so one of the aspects of the Common Core is to give plenty of opportunities for group projects, for um, making up work, for taking retests if you did poorly, towards giving you basically the answer so that what most parents are seeing to them doesn't look alarming. So they won't understand what's going on in the classroom. You've got uh, the real push involving flipped learning going on right now, where you watch a video and then you um, you have the group work in class. And, and a lot of, of what goes on in class is really more social interaction and what they call a discourse classroom, where the bright students' vocabulary basically becomes common property of everybody in the classroom. Um, it's, it's, they call it distributed intelligence. Um, <laughs> we're laughing, laughing but, we're, but they we're, did call it distributed in, intelligence. It's just like a defined term in Ed World, oh, wow. and that's one of the reasons they wanted to get rid of tracking. They want want a world where the children of educated parents, the kids who are able to travel well, all of their life experiences from coming from an upper middle class uh, family will be accessible to uh, every child in the classroom. Or more to the point, that the 
better educated children aren't able to benefit from it and uh, that they're all reduced to the same level of dumbness because you don't and it's it's like everything else when you try to redistribute you make people equally miserable at a lower level yeah and they use the term regularly uh nea uh regularly uses the term that the common core is about leveling um, they use equity, and they mean equity in terms of uh, equality of outcomes. They do not like bright kids, partly because it's, it's bright kids who can also come up with the world-shifting uh, technology. And uh, part, of, part of the associated policies that are, that are connected to Common Core is this idea that in the 21st century we're not going to have technology going to production stage in any country without the UN's approval. And so they want to control, um, they want to really limit technological developments going forward, which is a tremendous boondoggle to people who currently hold patents on existing technology. Instead of having to worry about somebody coming up with a better mousetrap, we're going to say stop. And um, it's, you know, so you get companies that are should be worrying about the consumers and coming up with a better product who are putting most of their effort into education reforms and pushing these policies that benefit them not ju- I call it level one and level two crony capitalism in the book level one is that you secure the public contract that's worth millions or potentially billions in providing all the computer technology the software managing the database level two crony capitalism is this idea that we're going to use these education reforms to change the nature of the economy and make it far more cronyistic. So if you have a seat at the table currently, if you have, you know, you're big enough to have lobbyists in Washington and in the state capitals, you get to be one of the designated providers of products and services in this new vision of the economy, and everybody else just is out of luck. Okay, so that, um, you lead to a very good point there, Robin, uh, because I was going to ask you what value people like Bill Gates uh, are getting out of supporting uh, Common Core and uh, and educational efforts, because on the uh, surface it appears to be altruistic. Am I correct in hearing you say that what they're trying to do is to destroy the uh, next generation of competition so that in 50 years' time we'll still be using Windows 16 uh, uh, with a little bit of DOS hiding underneath it? That does appear to be what's going on. That is definitely part of it. Um, wow. And you see on slides that they'll, they'll play up the companies that were involved in this before who are now gone or are a fraction of their previous size. So you'll see a slide that talks about buy WorldCom, buy DEC. You remember digital equipment? I worked, for, I, they are? I worked for digital equipment. All right. They trumpet the former big players who are no longer around as part of the push related to these education. <laughs> 21st century learning. In like, other words... You, you the, can't yeah. make this stuff up. It's... it's I, it truly is that the real story of what's going on, it beats any science fiction you've ever read. So, so let me sum this up. Bill Gates and his cohorts are standing there on the beach like King Canute, trying to roll back creative destruction and the, and the laws of Hayek. Uh, and uh, in the end, Hayek will win. This business of uh, having... Uh, massive supercomputing power and, and government centralization is, of course, doomed to fail because of Hayek's own uh, understanding that you can never have all the knowledge you need to control everything, and you shouldn't try. Right. I mean, that's part of it. It's. It's. I mean, it's not him in particular, although I, he, I, Microsoft does benefit from this vision. But I would... I would guess from the comments I have read of him that he has he is he's kind of a true believer in this new society and this vision of of every of equity for everyone and changing uh, the, uh, this idea that that we have more than enough in the West and we need to redistribute it to Latin America and Africa and um, I talk in the book some about this idea that we're going to have quality growth. When you hear the word growth, they really mean we're going to 
have a lower standard of living, but we're going to make it up in having better relationships. The whole thing is absurd. It's always and the billionaires, have... always the billionaires that come up with these ideas. Well, yeah, because well, they've but... got enough, and they want to pull the ladder up behind them and make sure that when they think about us having enough already, they're talking about a much level, lower level than them having enough already. I think it's fun to be a king, you know. And historically, <laughs> yeah, there's historically, one of those. Yeah, there's yeah, one of those in the White House. <laughs> yeah, econ, econ, historically, economic power and political power have been al- aligned under one sovereign. That's the norm. Where you broke away from it in Holland, then in the U.K., and in the U.S., you had enormous prosperity available from the fact that you were no longer separating knowledge and power. When you talk about cronyism, you're talking about going back to the old view of, of uniting political and economic power. And, and you know, I, I call it invisible surf collar because it is a very – medieval view of people as something some people where where you dictate what they are going to be able to know and do and and to a large extent if you understand that the level of of the social and emotional learning that's part of the actual common core implementation they're they're going after what you feel as well robin Um, we have uh, reached the end of our segment Unfortunately. And I've got so many questions. This has been fabulous. We're going to push this up. Uh, we're going to promote it. And we'd love to have you back in a few weeks if you wouldn't mind. I'd love to. And, and hi, New Hampshire. Um, thanks uh, for having me on. Do, do you do speaking engagements? Can we get you up here if we can find a sponsor? Yeah, I, I am starting to do speaking engagements now that I have the book out. All right. Great. great. Uh, we will uh, try to make arrangements with you to, to get in touch again. Thanks again for being on Grok Talk. Robin Eubanks, author of uh, Credential to Destroy. I'm Steve. I'm here with Skip and Mike. And we'll be right back. <laughs> 